Good afternoon. Welcome to the S.J. Hall Lecture in Industrial Forestry. I'm Keith Gillis, uh, Professor Emeritus of Forest Economics, former Dean of the Rouser College of Natural Resources, and I am pleased to be here with you all this afternoon, and I join you in looking forward to this evening's program on carbon market contributions to timberland returns. Uh, before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to take an opportunity to tell you just a bit about the lectureship's namesake and his lasting legacy here at UC Berkeley. Sherwood J. Hall was a graduate of our forestry program, uh, earning his bachelor's in 1920. After graduation, his career took him to the East Coast, then to the South, where he played a major role in the development of industrial forestry. In 1948, he returned to the West Coast, where he quickly emerged as a leader in industrial sustained yield management of young growth redwood. Uh, upon his death in 1968, his widow, Mrs. Desi Hall, established both the S.J. Hall Lectureship in Industrial Forestry and the S.J. Hall Chair in Forest Economics. Matthew Potts, who's the current S.J. Hall Distinguished Professor, is attending this evening. I'm a former holder of that chair. Um, uh, S.J. Hall felt strongly that economic understanding is basic to effective forestry and to a strong nation, and in keeping with that sentiment today, we continue to hold this annual lecture in his honor. Uh, joining us for this uh, evening's event will be moderator Dr. Clark Binkley. Uh, Binkley has been involved in forestry investments on nearly every continent in the world and with climate change may be going for the, uh, the series. Uh, his experience uh, has included academic positions at Yale University and the University of British Columbia, corporate positions with Hancock Natural Resource Management Group, uh, International Forest uh, Investment Advisors, a firm he founded, and Greenwood Resources, the Timberland Investment Arm of TIAA Kraft Nuvin Asset Management. He's also uh, acted as a consultant to numerous forest products companies, government agencies, and conservation groups. He's a prolific author in the field of forest economics and holds degrees in applied mathematics and engineering from Harvard and in forestry and environmental studies from Yale. Joining uh, Dr. Binkley this evening, our panelists, Elizabeth Wilmot, the Carbon Program Director at Microsoft, Dick Kempa, uh, Vice President of Conservation at Moldbus Woodlands Group, and Christine Paulette Young, Director of the Greenhouse Gas Verification Program at SCS Global. Uh, there will be time for audience questions at the end of the program. If you have questions, please type them into the YouTube chat function. And uh, finally, before we begin this uh, evening's program, I'd like to recognize that although we are all attending this lecture in different places, we here in Berkeley are all on unceded native lands uh, here occupying the traditional and unceded territory of the Cochenyo Olone people. Thank you for joining us this evening. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Clark Banquet. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm Clark Binkley, your moderator uh, today. And I'd also like to thank uh, the, the College at Berkeley and the S.J. Hall Lectureship for organizing what I think will be a most interesting panel on how can carbon markets contribute to timberland uh, returns. Uh, the format is three short presentations by our distinguished panelists and then some uh, some questions. And we invite the audience to, to pose questions because that's the most probably going to be uh, a very interesting aspect of this, uh, this hour today. So I'd like to introduce the panelists and we'll first have the buyers tell us what they think about carbon markets, particularly with respect to forests, and then have the sellers say what they're selling. And then uh, the market mediators talk about how do you get the sellers and the buyers together in a better way. So representing the buyers is, um, is Elizabeth Wilmot, as, as Keith said, the carbon program director at Microsoft. Liz leads the carbon program for Microsoft, including the company's carbon uh, fee and commitment to carbon removal as well. She joined Microsoft in 2016 after a decade of working in urban sustainability and climate action in both the public and nonprofit sectors. 
Um, she's co-authored a book, a World Bank Guide for Cities on how to prepare for climate change impacts. She holds a, a double major in biology and Chinese language, something that would be quite useful these days of the pandemic, I think, uh, from Williams College and a master's degree in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I'd like to note here that Microsoft has posted a couple of very interesting white papers on this subject, and I commend all of you to read them. So Liz will start off. Our second speaker uh, representing Sellers is Dick Kemka, who's a vice president of conservation at Malpas Woodlands Group. Malpas Woodlands Group is a large timberland investment management organization. Dick joined Malpas in 2017 and has over 25 years of experience in sustainability, carbon, timberland, grasslands, wetlands, mitigation, acquisitions, and sales. He was formerly the chief commercial officer for the Climate Trust and vice president of environment for Equator and then Ecological Asset Program Lead for Ducks Unlimited. He received a BS in Geography and Remote Sensing from Carroll College in Wisconsin and his master's degree in Geography and Remote Sensing from Indiana State University. And then our third panelist, uh, representing what is a very tough position in between buyers and sellers, is Christy Pollitt-Young, who's the Director of Greenhouse Gas Verification Programs at SCS Global. Uh, um, she's uh, the program that she leads has verified over 290 million tons of CO2 equivalent uh, around the globe. She has 25 years of experience in forestry and carbon offset verification in both tropical and temperate climates. Uh, Christy previously worked for the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute's Center for Tropical Forest Science and at the Nature Conservancy in per Peru. She holds a Master's of Forest Science from Yale and a Bachelor of Science from this distinguished institution who's hosting uh, our, our meeting today, UC Berkeley. She's the lead auditor with SCS and has participated in the verification of over 50 forest carbon uh, offset projects around the globe. Well, with that introduction, I'll turn this over to our first panelist, uh, Liz Wilmot. Liz? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Clark. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. And I know some friends are in the audience, so I look forward to uh, perhaps um, mentioning some of the work that uh, we've done with Berkeley as I, um, as I talk about a bit about what we do at Microsoft. So why you might ask, why, why does Microsoft get so invested, is why is Microsoft so invested in climate action? Well, it's a pretty straightforward answer for us. We know, first of all, we're humans living on the planet. We know that the natural world and the global political world are telling us we're out of balance. We know that the atmospheric ledger and the laws of science are equally important and more important than our corporate ledgers and that nature has a long memory. And, and we uh, took all of this into account in January, 2020, when we first set our carbon negative commitment, which is a commitment to cut our greenhouse gas emissions across our value chain by over half by 2030, remove the rest, and then remove the equivalent of our historical emissions. And this was based on strong direction from our executives to uh, uh, really take responsibility for, um, for what, we've, what we've done in the past, the emissions we've made in the past, and for um, a real sense, a greater sense that those who can afford to do more should. And so after a year of uh, implementing this program, a year plus of implementing this program, and a year of intense climate impacts that we've seen not only in the west coast of the United States, but also around the world through forest fires and flooding. We're moving into the new political season of COP26, the Conference of the Parties, with a deeper commitment to climate action than ever. And we're driven really as a data company and a science company fundamentally by what climate science tells us is needed to avoid catastrophic climate change. Indeed, we're all already seeing these climate impacts happening. We're on um, a dangerous path, but um, we are still uh, taking, up that, taking up that mantle and really um, driving with everything that we do across the company to, um, to uh, help not only ourselves, but also our customers and our stakeholders drive to global net zero. We approach that in three ways. We like to alliterate. So we say um, meaning, measurement, and markets. And in terms of meaning, when we say uh, net zero, 
people mean different things and entities mean different things. There's a lot of confusion out there in the world today about what is carbon neutral, what is net zero. And so fundamentally for us, we feel that there is a, um, a need to be, again, to be guided by climate science, not only saying that, um, that an entity would be net zero simply by purchasing carbon offsets, but indeed um, that we have to think about what is truly global net zero. And that's why as part of our carbon negative commitment, we actually committed to remove greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere. We are among the first companies to do so. And we did that as a, as a, a measure of, um, uh, of a need to really square the carbon math or the climate math, knowing that the atmosphere doesn't doesn't care as much about avoided emissions. Yes, truly avoided emissions are important, but cares more about what's actually um, being removed from the atmosphere. And so for us, that's been a crucial, a crucial piece. Um, in terms of measurement, we've also seen a real need across the board for clear arithmetic, clear carbon math of how we track progress to global net zero, clear carbon accounting for carbon removal. This is a crucial issue in the forestry sector because when we first sourced our, our first year of carbon removal credits, we saw vast divergence and vast uh, confusion around what's an avoided emissions credit, what's a removal credit. And I'd be glad to get into some of that in our, in our Q&A, but really fundamentally we see a really significant need to have more straightforward carbon accounting. And then finally, we, uh, we have really embraced uh, a new, mission and a new responsibility on our team for helping to develop the market for carbon removal. And that fundamentally is about the supply of solutions that uh, company, companies like ourselves can, um, can purchase or can embrace to um, apply to our carbon footprint. So typically that has taken the shape of, um, historically that has taken the shape of carbon offsets, but again, we're really focused on um, carbon removal credits, a form of offset to be clear, that, um, that are fundamentally about pulling carbon from the atmosphere. So we issued an RFP, a request for proposals uh, last year that was the first of its kind that resulted in the largest purchase of carbon removal in the history of the world, which was over 1 million tons. And we have subsequently also invested $100 million in the Breakthrough Energy, uh, a Breakthrough Energy Group's initiative, Catalyst, which is a group that will invest um, in crucial technologies to drive to net zero, including not only direct air capture, but also um, other technologies such as sustainable aviation fuel and green hydrogen. But fundamentally for us, we know that nature-based solutions such as forestry are essential to help. It's not just about looking to the future for, um, for new technologies, but also about looking to today for the short-term climate benefit that forestry and uh, soil carbon solutions represent. And so for us, it's really about how do we measure the true value of those of those nature-based solutions. We've seen a lot of variation in quality um, in the request for proposals and the sourcing that we've done. We see a really clear need for, for stronger standards around forest carbon removal. And we've been really um, lucky to work with a number of different fantastic researchers from Berkeley under the auspices of Carbon Direct. Um, those include Matt Potts, Barbara Haya, Bodhi Cambio, and Dan Sanchez. And um, maybe some of them are on the line today. I think that um, what we're seeing with the formation of groups like that and um, the real unleashing of um, carbon removal interest is um, indeed a nascent, um, but super, super promising market. And so for us, it's, it's really um, in the context of forestry, it's really about looking at these existing nature-based solutions, the, the original technology of photosynthesis, to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and to do so in a way that's really, really high quality. And so, um, as we dive into our discussion today, I'd be glad to. Um, I'm looking forward to a rich discussion about um, both the buyer's and the seller's perspective on this topic. And I'm just uh, appreciative that we're having this serious conversation today. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Liz, for those uh, thoughtful comments. And it raised a couple of questions in, in my mind, but I'll save them until we finish the uh, rest of the panelists. Our next uh, panelist is Dick Kempka from uh, Malpas, representing the seller side of the market. Uh, Dick? Thank you, Clark. And, and thank you um, also to the College of Natural Resources for the invite to attend this uh, workshop. I really appreciate it. And so I'm gonna, if, if you move down to uh, the, the fourth slide, I'm gonna skip some of the background. I put a lot of slides in here. So after the call, um, if anyone wants to look through this, they can, but I'm gonna just start off and give you a little bit of background on Mulpus Woodlands Group. Well, as Clark mentioned, Mulpus Woodlands Group is a TMO and we've been, we started as a, it, we're one of the oldest uh, forestry companies in the United States. We were started in 1905 as a mercantile exchange changed into um, a, a lumber company and ultimately in 19, mid 1990s changed into a, a TMO, which is a timber investment management organization. So the key word there is that we manage timber on behalf of our investors. Our investors are pension funds, retirement funds, teachers unions and alike. And so we have two kinds of funds. We have uh, commingled funds that are 300 to 500 million in size and they have a limited term of 10 to 15 years. So we don't hold the land forever, which is an important point. Uh, we have five commingled funds. We have nine separate managed accounts. Separate managed accounts are individual investors with over hundred million dollars um, that are invested into timberland. And uh, those, fun those funds can be perpetual or they can last 10 or 15 years. It just depends how long the client wants to be in the sector and what kind of returns uh, we're getting uh, for them. So if you move to the next slide, um, my job is to handle everything um, in the company that's non-timber related. So we're in business to make money on timber and I'm, I'm the value added guy. So I do all of our carbon projects, um, uh, mitigation banks and things, uh, conservation easements, solar and wind and things of that nature. So we're a fully vertically, vertically integrated company, which means that we have 115 employees that are biometricians, GIS specialists, uh, financial people, and, and not just a few people sitting in, on the East Coast and subcontracting everything out. Um, we have over one, this map shows the red dots show where our land is. The, all the green is the, are all the different wood baskets in the United States. We have about 1.8 million acres under management now with a total asset value of over $2, million, $2 billion. So if you move to the next slide, um, I think uh, Liz and, and Clark kind of already covered this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but we believe that um, sustainably managed forests are the key to reducing carbon emissions in the future. And that through that whole growth uh, cycle, um, of capturing CO2, harvesting timber, storing carbon in long-term wood products and replanting or reductions are gonna be the key to the future um, for, for climate. So if you go to the next slide, um, we have, by the way, Mulpus is sustainably certified under SFI for all of our properties and we're a dual certified in some of our properties with FSC. And we're also a signatory to the UN principles for responsible investing. And so, as I mentioned, the natural climate solutions or nature-based solutions, that is conservation, restoration, and improved land management um, can be a big part of the solution. And there was a paper recently released in the Proceedings of National, National Academy of Sciences by TNC and 10 or 12 other groups saying that could be up to a third of emissions reductions could come from this from these uh, forestry, grassland and wetland projects by the year 2030 to keep us below that important 1.5 or two uh, Celsius degree change that we're all trying to avoid. And so um, I think Christy's gonna cover this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but there's gotta be common units and accounting for these type of projects, otherwise they're no good. So there's a common unit called the one ton of metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent or one ton um, there's two kinds of markets. There's a cap and trade a regulated market. There's voluntary markets. Each of these exists for different purposes. One is to uh, keep emissions under a cap in California, for instance, and the other voluntary uh, market is for those who, who um, have um, want to reduce their um, emissions through, through shareholder pressure and, and net zero commitments. 
And these registries provide carbon accounting that's been very well vetted, such as the bottom icons, the uh, verified carbon standard, climate action reserve and, and American carbon registry all have spent a lot of time publicly vetting and going through scientific assessment of what counts as an emission reduction and what doesn't. So I just wanted to point out without these carbon accounting uh, uh, protocols, there would not be there would not be good carbon crediting pr projects. Next slide. So this is the this is my last slide, but I wanted to spend some time on it. This shows the environmental projects that Molpus has done. We've got one of the key things for us is publicly accessible sites where people can uh, recreate and hike and and enjoy nature. And we've got six almost six hundred ninety thousand acres. Um, of that in, in the blue in the blue dots throughout the United States, we have um, almost 420,000 acres of conservation easements throughout our properties throughout the United States. Those are the the green the green dots. Um, and one of our biggest growing areas um, is in solar and wind. We've done 20 different solar projects over the last two years. We've got some wind leases in the north. That are represented on this map, but I want to talk about the carbon projects that we've done. We've done over 20 carbon projects, both voluntary and compliance, uh, covering over a million acres, and we've generated almost nearly seven million tons of carbon credits um, with a with a re revenue value of almost 78 million dollars. And so, what I wanted to do is talk about one of those projects in the north. If you see Minnesota, the red dot up there is what we call a Meriwether land and timber. This is, we're the largest private landowner in Minnesota. We have about 300,000 acres there. And we started a carbon project there about um, three years ago on about half of the property. After some analysis, we picked about half of the property to do the property on. And I'm gonna step you through the steps we have to go to get these credits issues and is sold. So we have an inventory that we do on that property that we did in 2018. That's a full blown timber inventory, similar to a timber inventory, except it measures commercial and non-commercial trees down to two inches in diameter. Then we capture that information. We go through a whole carbon uh, baseline modeling exercise to determine the volume. We have to consult with our advisory boards for our funds to see if they wanna participate in this. We submit the project to the registry. The registry has, um, once we get the um, um, verification report, uh, we have to submit that project to the registry. The registry has to approve it. It then goes on to the Air Resources Board. This is a compliance project in California. The Air Resources Board uh, must approve it. That takes quite a bit of time. And as of December of last year, this project was awarded over 3 million tons of carbon credits. And that's one of the largest non-native land projects in, in the United States. And so over the course of the next uh, six months, we forward sold and spot traded um, uh, nearly that full volume of credits that we had for the project. And, and then each year after that, we, we, can, we can sell we can get carbon credits for whatever um, annual biological growth is not harvested can be verified and, and produce credits as well. So now we're into the uh, next reporting periods on this project. So that whole process took about three years and it cost several hundred thousand dollars to set up the project, but the revenue we got from it was north of $35 million. So it was a very large project and, and very worthwhile. Um, just one other project I wanted to mention in the, in the Kentucky, uh, Tennessee border is a project called Ataya. It was a very similar project, very large. It was an ecologically significant area that the Nature Conservancy was interested in. Um, it, it was 100,000 acres and about 80,000 were put into the compliance program in California. The same steps were done on all those. I'm not going to go through all those. It produced about 3 million tons as well, very large project. And the key thing about this project is it, we did not sell the credits. We actually, the Nature Conservancy was interested in purchasing the property. And so we sold them the project property with the credits issued. And so they now have that pro property and they put it into their NatureVest program as part of their Cumberland 
gap conservation program. So the, the, the end result was the project ended up with a conservation organization. So our idea um, is to generate revenue and address environmental social governance issues for our clients. And that's why we got involved in these projects. And I'll end it there, Clark. Uh, thanks so much, Dick. Really interesting to see the kind of practical nuts and bolts about how you actually do a project and create credits that uh, you can sell to, to someone. It'll be interesting to have a conversation later on uh, with, uh, with Liz about the nature of the credits and how that works from her perspective as well. So our third and final speaker is uh, Christy Pollitt Young, who's going to talk to us as the, the person who's in the middle here, who has to actually verify the credits and, and let the, the buyers know that they're, they're really something worth, worth, uh, worth purchasing. So I'll turn this over to you, Christy. Thanks. Thank you so much, Clark. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's homecoming weekend. I'm a cow bear and it's my 25th actually. So I'm also happy to say that um, my ESPM degree, so environmental science policy and management is being used. This is a very inter interdisciplinary um, venture doing carbon offset projects. We work internationally as well as domestically. So lots of hats to be worn. Next slide, please. Yeah, so you can click one more time, please, Rachel. Just to, you know, so you know who we are, SES Global Services. We work on environmental claims. We're an auditing company and standards development. So we look at all types of sustainability. You probably know us from our store or stewardship, stewardship council certification. We do other things like organic and recycled content. Next slide. Next slide. Uh oh. Okay. And just um, the vision of SES for mission based is we'd like to remake the world and the vision of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So here they are. Next slide. That's fine. Um, so why offsets? I'm sure these are familiar to a lot of you. It's one tool, one of many tools to fight climate change through decarbonization. There is no silver bullet. There is no panacea. Offsets are one way to do it. Um, I actually hope it's an intermediary step because it'd be really wonderful if we start um, to have payment for ecosystem services, internalizing costs to nature and biodiversity and the way we do business. And maybe this could be a, um, a part of a circular economy if we kind of move towards that. We think, I think offsets are a component and catalyst for that. It's also a way for companies to demonstrate corporate social responsibility. We've seen that it's important for recruiting and retention of um, and great employees, especially with this younger generation, which I'm very happy about. And also to support carbon neutrality goals, innovation and transformation. Next slide, please. So here's some folks that are actually doing sustainability plans. Hello, Liz. Thank you, Microsoft. Next slide. And just here's a very simple example of a sustainability plan. And I like to just break down that it's reducing emissions through policy changes, technology, energy efficiency, doing what you can to really lower your footprint, collecting and reporting your footprint, knowing what it is, and then doing offsets to become carbon neutral negative. It's not just doing what you're already doing <laughs> and buying some offsets. It's doing as much as you can, realizing I can't do any more, and then doing offsets. Um, next step, step slide. Okay, here is an example of some of the projects that SES has verified in the US. Um, so the green are improved forest management, the blue is afforestation, reforestation, yellow is grassland, and then purple and pink are ozone depleting substances and landfills. And then if you moved, it's on our website, if you moved, there's a lot of red projects as well. So we verified over 290 million tons of, of carbon offsets, um, carbon equivalent. Next slide. For a sample of some of our domestic clients, you can see that there's industrial forestry, nonprofits, TMOs, um, a utility there. We have a municipality in county um, in Washington, DNR, Michigan. Next slide, please. Here's some of the standards that we work with as uh, 
Dick mentioned, there is the cap and trade program of California, as well as voluntary standards. Next slide. Okay, why do we need verification? What is the point of all this? So it's really simple. We need independence so that buyers and sellers, and I always like to think of my mom, a very smart person, but doesn't have a PhD in biometrics or remote sensing, to know that there is quality, that this thing is, um, she can just buy her credits, feel good about her offsets. So we're independent people to say that this um, offset has market integrity, it has durability, um, again, quality. And then for the lawyers, right? We want them to sleep well at night. We're reducing risk. So social media risk, reputational risk, legal risk, financial, all these things to say that this project followed the rules, sound forestry, sound biometrics, sound mensuration, all these things that these credits are something that we can stand by. Next slide. Okay, so just a little bit of SES, kind of mentioned like these things, world leaders, and one of the things that sets us apart is that we are accredited under the International Standards Organization. So we follow a simple set, not simple, a set of rules for quality management systems, competence, um, all the quantitative aspects. And we've done this in a streamlined fashion to evaluate projects around the world. We've seen the good, bad, and the ugly. And this has been really helpful to understand some of the pitfalls um, in carbon accounting or remote sensing. And none of our verifications have been overturned. Next slide. So just really quickly, here's the process. Um, there's, I only have five more minutes. So essentially uh, we put people like Dick through the ringer <laughs> and we have a kickoff meeting to talk about what's happening, look at documents. Um, we'll do a desk review, site visit. We'll, for each of these steps, we'll say if we need more information, if the project is not in conformance with the requirement or basic statistics. Um, we'll write a report, we'll do a technical review with someone who has been outside of the process, reviews everything to make sure it makes sense, it's sound, and then we'll submit it to the registry. So Rachel, I'm gonna zip through these. Next slide, please. So here's the desk review. There could be a public comment period. We green light the site visit. Once we found somebody not measuring trees at um, DBH, they're measuring at the root collar, we did not go. And we also look at safety and access, seasonal conditions. Next step, next slide. Site visit, we'll look at the audit um, plan, interview folks and look at geospatial information since, such as ownership and boundaries, data management, growth and yield modeling, different allometric calculations of biomass. Next slide. And then this is a the fun part. We go on site, we do the cruise, we'll measure trees, we'll do a T test to make sure that our inventories um, are matching um, enough. And um, we'll also do boundary and um, ownership checks. So, what are people doing? Next slide. Okay, here's it's fine. That was um, the T test spreadsheet. So um, again, we'll just let people know if they have any issues that need to be resolved. We'll do checks on environmental health and safety, and we'll also let people know, um, you know, if, what needs to be resolved. This is the data analysis section, um, baseline quantification, review of financial and legal feasibility, looking at harvested wood products, everyone's favorite, the buffer pool. So in case there are intentional or unintentional risks, so right now we're in fire season in California. It grew by a month this year. So people always want to know about buffer pool and the, that it, there is a contribution for that to make sure that there is something to guard against these unintentional reversals. Um, but if you do true treatments such as you know, thinning or field breaks to reduce fire risk, um, different management, shade field breaks, you can reduce your contribution to the buffer pool. Next slide, please. Keep going. <laughs> okay, issuing the report, lots of documentation, lots of workflows. Next slide. Okay, technical review. Again, this is where the independent person comes in to make sure that the auditor did everything well. Next slide. Registry review, more checking, so much checking by different people. Next slide. Okay. Lessons learned, what did we learn from this? Um, you are uh, 
your dick, <laughs> I would tell him. And I think he's he's gone through this before, and I think he knows this, to develop a rigorous new inventory designed for carbon, not for production forestry. You cannot just measure merchantable trees 10 inches in diameter or greater. So um, we're looking, so that's been a new thing. And the information, the actual product is the inventory. So we want to make sure that that's really um, done to a high level precision. Working with experienced project developers and technical staff, people that actually can run roof and yield models, people that do these analyses, they feel really good with um, geospatial information, interpretation, um, providing complete documentation with evidence. So lots of maps, lots of, you know, scaling reports, management plans, anything to show us that you've done everything correctly. Community buy-in is important, especially in international projects. And then just as, just above all everything, we're the quality people. We want folks to focus on quality and integrity. The system must work. Um, this must work. The system in the market needs to continue. Sorry, there's a typo. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, what is the future of offsets? So definitely government and corporate leadership as we're seeing through Liz. Um, as well as scaling with quality. We want to scale, but how do we scale with quality? So there is definitely technology, lots of cool technological advances in remote sensing or data collection, but also the green technology like trees and just keeping everything simple and understanding the basics of forestry and doing that well, um, as well as you know fundamentals like understanding how to select the right estimators for you know statistics when you're doing these projects as well as I think this is extremely important uh, speaking to a forestry school, is training a new cadre of specialists. Like we need to scale up. We need a lot of offsets. We really need to reduce our emissions uh, around the world. And we need folks to not only develop these projects, we need people to, to also to verify them and to also know how to buy them. We just need to raise a new group of folks that can actually have the skill set to do these things. So I you know, I would love to hire folks from Berkeley and Yale, my alma maters and other folks, but they don't always have the right skill sets. So there's a, a lack of um, knowledge in remote sensing, as well as growth and yield mod modeling, allometry, other aspects that are really important to this um, role. Another is, you know, focusing on impact and then improvement. We don't have all the answers now. We need to identify issues in terms of the data, the science, or kind of different areas with, with challenges, and then go from there and have more science directed at it. Because we can't, I, I think there's a lot of detractors out there that would say that there's issues. So let's just throw the whole thing away. You know, what is the great conclusion of any scientific paper? More research, more data. So I would say, let's identify what's needed and focus on that. And, you know, and if need be, let's be conservative, have um, lower um, baselines and maybe a higher buffer pool contribution. And then for all of this, raising the price of carbon will allow more players, more people in um, wanting to do forestry, wanting to do carbon. Um, I know that for me right now, the price of carbon, the Biden administration raised it to $51 a ton. It used to be like four in the last administration, but economists think it should be about 150 a ton. And Canada is leading the way in 2030, it's going to be 170. So I think raising that price, putting a price on carbon and understanding that that's needed to have a real impact is important. And then I could also hire really wonderful people that have the technical capabilities to do this work at a great salary so they could, you know, help climate as well as feed their families in a nice way and not work at NASA, which is their other alternative given the tremendous skills needed to do this work. So next slide, please. So just a little quote from Voltaire, perfect is the enemy of the good. I think there's definitely areas that identified for improvement. Let's focus on those and, you know, make offsets of one of the solutions for climate change. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Christy. Very, very interesting presentation. And I know we're going to get some, uh, some questions coming from the audience, but uh, there are a few that came to my mind. Uh, and one of them was related to this concept of quality of credits. And Liz, you mentioned that several times, and Christy, you mentioned it. And so I'd like to come back to each of you with a question about that. And first with Liz, um, you know, an open-ended question, uh, you know, what, when you think of quality, what are you thinking of a little, little more deeply? 
Sure. I think there's several criteria that we uh, we use to measure quality in our purchases of carbon removal credits. Those include durability, the amount of time that carbon removal is actually kept, at, carbon is actually removed out of the atmosphere. Um, durability is queen, uh, as we say at Microsoft, it's, it's king, it's queen, it's everything. And um, for us, I think the future will have to be, um, the future of carbon removal will have to be um, being able to measure durability consistently across project types. So forestry, soil, and the engineering solutions, that's really crucial. Additionality and leakage are also um, both simultaneously important and really tricky. Um, additionality is essentially whether or not uh, carbon is removed on a net new basis relative to what would have happened without climate finance. Leakage is whether or not, I think you probably all know this, many of you know this better than I, but um, leakage is essentially whether or not a project shifts um, emissions to another region as a result of um, economic displacement. And um, we've done some, we've been excited to do some really interesting um, inquiry on that with Barbara Haya and, and Matt Potts and others um, to really help advance the, advance the conversation there. And um, for us, it's really about just continuing to shore those criteria up and continuing to be really transparent about what we're looking for, because we, um, we know that it's, you know, this carbon removal market is very nascent and um, it's not something that's been around for 20 years. It's really been around for about one and a half years or, or slightly mm -hmm. more. And so um, continuing to iterate on those criteria will be really crucial for us. Uh, thanks, Liz. And, and to Christy, um, I, I'm going to ask this in kind of a nice way then and maybe a not so nice way. Uh, the, the nice way is, you know, you've talked about and you showed a slide of many different uh, verification standards. Uh, and so what are the differences uh, between them? Now, the not so nice way is, geez, if there are that many different standards, it must mean that none of them, re none, none of them really stands out as being, as being really good. So I'm just curious about your reaction to those comments. Um, I think that there, it's like a car for ice cream. There's a flavor or, or version for everyone and maybe what fits your criteria needs. You definitely need to do a feasibility study. I mean, I think that some people might be attracted to the cap and trade program of the California Air Resources Board. The prices are quite higher, the tons. Um, I think it's about $14 a ton now. But I think some people don't like to be beholden to the Attorney General of the state of California. So that might scare them away. The period of uh, monitoring is 100 years. Some people just don't want to commit their family to that long. So then there's the voluntary market where the prices are a little bit lower, but the, the rules are different. So I think it really just depends on the criteria of your fact of your standards. And I think in terms of quality, I think that's really interesting that it there we really need to have sound methodologies that use the best science, use the best approaches. But at the end of the day, it's very complicated and that we need good people to be doing these and to make these methodologies. We have established several and they are peer reviewed. There's uh, verifiers that look at them in some cases. But at the same time, we're realizing that it might not quite work in the lake states or we might need to make a little tweak in this part of Indonesia. So it's one of those things where we're learning and we just need to be flexible and understand where more growth opportunities, more learning needs to take place. And improve upon that. And that's why just today, one of the standards had a, a, a rata and clarification to come out with a new approach to one of the equations. So we're learning that, you know, when we're testing them in different areas, um, they, they might need to be updated. Okay, thank you. You know, uh, from the audience, there have been a number of questions related to fire. And, you know, they, that really is an important issue because, you know, as, as many people know, the, um, you know, a, uh, there were some CARB, uh, California registry credits uh, in Southern Oregon that were burned up in one of the big fires. And, and obviously that's brought uh, this issue to uh, front of mind. I, I wonder, and I'll just ask uh, each of you, each of the panelists to comment uh, briefly on how they think about fire uh, with respect to uh, carbon credits related to forest. So maybe start with you, Dick, and then, uh, then uh, Christy, then Liz. Yeah, well, first of all, I would say we haven't purchased any land in the West. Um, in California, uh, we have land in um, Eastern Washington and Oregon, which has experienced fires. None of those are in carbon projects. I think the protocols do a good job of setting up a buffer pool that can be used for um, for the whole program. So if, if, if you know, for each project that we we uh, 
put into the California program, for instance, there's a buffer pool that's assigned anywhere from 15 to 20%. And those credits go into the buffer pool and we never get those credits back and they're to cover projects that have fire risk and are higher risk. Um, so I would say we're, uh, our company is reticent. I think at this point, we haven't looked at, we've looked at some California property, we haven't purchased any. And I think fire is one of, one of those reasons. Um, but I do think the protocols um, handle uh, fire uh, well, at least the California protocol does. So I'll leave it there and let listen to the other answers. So Chris, do you want? Yeah, I think it's astute um, observation. And yeah. as we know, the fire this, this year, 2021 will be the best fire season that we'll have for the rest of time. It's only gonna get worse, unfortunately, due to extreme weather events. So I think it is important to look at that. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that there was research done across the United States about the buffer pool contribution. Experts did do a study and they found 4% at, at the time to be a good number. Um, it might be time to update that research and figure out what really is happening because, you know, even, you know, nine, 10 years ago is, is a long time with the, the climate change events that we're noticing. Um, my conservative quality minded approach would be to raise the buffer pool contribution just to be conservative and potentially if things look great um, after a certain amount of time, it's not needed, the buffer pool can be released to the project over time, which is a model in some of the other um, standards. And I will say that we have seen that um, fire management is actually a part of carbon projects. One of the projects we looked at was not harvesting or reducing their harvest and they wanted to raise, use carbon revenue specifically for fuels treatment and fire management primarily to protect their land but also because their neighbors weren't so they needed to have extra revenue to make sure that their fire uh, their lands could be intact as in the, as to the question of how much has been replaced uh, or burnt in this last uh, few years it, it's uncertain um, but there is you know not that many carbon projects um across the West, you know, it is a small percentage of the land and we do know that it is heavily stocked with fuel. So it is a universal problem. So Liz, I'd be curious of your thoughts on this and particularly how comfortable you are with the uh, buffer stock concept as a way of dealing with, uh, with fire risk. It's a great question. And I'll be really candid. Uh, some of the carbon, one of the carbon offset projects, carbon removal projects that we purchased from last year did um, sustain damage in the bootleg fire. So we're very clear right about that risk. We had actually, prior to the prior to our purchase last year, we had actually funded the nonprofit carbon plan out of, um, out of the Bay Area to do an assessment of forest carbon projects um, against climate risk data sets, specifically fire, pests, and drought. And um, it's been very sobering to see not only their conclusions, which are available online, but also simply just the human impact that we've been um, experiencing on the West Coast of the United States. It's clear that um, forests are indeed in some regions on path to becoming more of a source than a sink, which is um, incredibly um, significant for, um, for how we move forward in the future. But at the same time, we at Microsoft are not not scared away from investing in nature-based solutions. We know that we need more corporate investment, even broadly and independent of carbon offsets. We need more corporate investment in nature-based solutions, not less. There's simply not enough um, public money out there today to protect nature-based solutions in the way that we, um, we need to. And so with respect to the specific question about buffer pools, um, we think that it's not only um, important to have bigger buffer pools, like Christy has said, I totally, totally agree with that, but also specifically for buyers like us to require recourse in our contracts when uh, carbon projects do get reversed, when carbon gets removed, uh, reversed back into the atmosphere. And so that's something um, we work on in all of our, we require in all of our contracts, whether it's buffer pools or another, um, another medium, um, and we, we are keeping a really close eye on it because um, it's clearly, a, clearly an issue. Yeah, the recourse is kind of like the Consumer Protection Act for carbon credits, right? Right. Um, 
I'd like to change top directions a little bit and then pose a question directly uh, to Dick. He talked about a couple of projects where they sold substantial amounts of, of uh, carbon and generated considerable revenue. And I'd just be curious, uh, Dick, what kind of impact can carbon projects have on property level returns? And I'm not asking for state secrets here, but you know, just in ranges, does this, does this uh, like uh, up to 100 basis points of return, 100 to 300? Uh, it's wildly variable everywhere. I'd just be interested, curious about your thoughts on that. Well, it's a good question, Clark. And we don't know yet until we close the fund out what the final uh, increase uh, to, or impact to basis points are. And so the way we viewed it is, A, um, uh, from the revenue side, um, what kind of revenue is it going to bring in the short term? And then secondly, we look at it on a per Per acre, um, per acre revenue side as well. So we have, I would say in the compliance projects um, overall, I think we've seen about 150 to $300 per acre that have come out from all of our six compliance projects together, if I had to give you a range. And for voluntary projects, you know, we 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 are looking at probably five or six voluntary projects that are traditional and proof force management projects, and uh, on mainly on on our southern properties, and those are going to probably be in the range if we go forward with them on uh, fifty to a hundred, hundred twenty five dollars an acre. And so I can't comment on the basis points until our funds close, uh, but that's where we are. And the reason I can't is because. When you put a carbon project on a property, it's similar to a long-term conservation easement, and there is an impact to the value of the property, and it impacts the appraisal of the property. So if you buy a property for $100 million and you, you get carbon money out of it, you have to weigh that with what the, the reduction in appraisal could be at the time, if any, at the time of disposition or at the time of sale. And so we look at these pro projects through many different lenses to determine if there's projects that will go forward or not. And we've had two or three big ones on the order of what I've described earlier that we passed on uh, uh, for, for, that, for that reason. Thanks a lot, Dick. That's very helpful. And in, in a couple of the places like in Minnesota and in the Appalachians, you know, if you have something like $100 or $300 per acre, that's a lot because that land didn't cost that much to begin with. Well, my, I'm being told it's time for us to uh, wrap up and I will then therefore do so under penalty of whatever they can do to me remotely. Um, and I'd like to thank all the panelists for those very excellent comments and responses to questions uh, and, and apologize to the audience that we didn't get to more of the questions because I see a steady stream of them here. I'd like to thank the audience for their questions and attention and uh, the University of California, Berkeley, and most particularly the Hall family for having the, the prescience uh, to fund something like this. So thanks a lot. Good evening.